this one's by request. So, everybody I talk about here, I'm using a fake name for because I believe anonymity is a thing, especially on the internet. Um, I'm going to keep mine, so I'm assuming other people want me to keep theirs as well. With one exception, and it was a slip. And I'm not going to change his name now. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about my brother, Tim. Uh, Tim died a bunch of years ago now. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Tim was my, uh, as he liked to always remind me, my big brother. Um, although I ended up being um, the same size he is. You know, I knew the... Uh, I, I've tried this recording before a couple times, and it's odd because my, you know, you know somebody for 50 years or 50 plus years, and you know, not every memory is horrible and not every memory is great. So I have to balance this. Let me start with the early years. I shared a uh, shared a room with with uh, with Tim. When, when we, uh, in the first house we lived in. And he had his bed on one wall and I had my bed on the other wall. And they were just little kid beds, you know, because we were just little kids. So it was always, it was, uh, we were always around each other. Always. We lived in a cul-de-sac. My mom had a thing for cul-de-sacs. She liked cul-de-sacs for raising kids. And, and I get it. Nobody's going to be just zipping down the street in a cul-de-sac. And if you live at the very end of a cul-de-sac, which is where we always lived, uh, you know, the only cars that were there were, you know, your car, you, you know, uh, the cars for your house and the cars for the, you know, two or three houses on each side. And they all knew kids lived there and played around in the cul-de-sac. Um, and we all knew to look out for cars. So mom would let us go play in the cul-de-sac all we wanted. Um, and, and we would, and eventually we both got bicycles. Now, Tim got his first cause he was, you know, older than me, 16, 16 months older. So he learned how to ride his bike and, and I have a couple of memories of, of just, you know, watching him and running around and chasing him and, you know, we were having a good time. And, and then eventually I was four or five and I got my first bicycle and, and the first thing Tim wanted to do, um, my father, my biological father was a uh, shop teacher. One of the shops he taught was auto shop. So he was always putzing around with the car. You got a mechanic that has a car. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to, he's going to, uh, you know, mess around on the car. I had my bicycle for a couple weeks I had learned how to ride without um, training wheels. I was a big boy now. So Tim decided he wanted to take my bicycle apart one day. So he got tools and he took my bicycle apart. Um, I don't know why he didn't do it to his. Well, I do know why he didn't do it to his. He wanted to ride his. You know, and I'm calling him names and it's, you know, at the time, I was, you know, quite irritated, as you would imagine. In hindsight, it's it's one of those great memories. My dad, my my uh, mom and dad were separated. My dad had to uh, come put it back together for me and, and make Tim promise that he'd never take it apart again. And he didn't. But it was just one of those, you know, things. Future me just pop it in for a second to tell this story. I will probably never run out of stories about Tim, but... Here's what I enjoyed. And I don't actually have a solid memory of it, but I believe it. So apparently Tim was four and was tired of putting up with mom and me and his sister and decided he was going to run away. So he gathered all his stuff. I have no idea what. And took off down the street. Now, we lived in a cul-de-sac, like I'd mentioned before, and that cul-de-sac was on a block. And at that age, we were not allowed to cross the street. So, Tim took off, and went out of the cul-de-sac, and Dad got in the car and followed him. 
And uh, because Tim was not allowed to cross the street, sure enough, 10 minutes later, here he comes tootling, tootling down the other, you know, the other entrance to the cul-de-sac there, the sidewalk entrance to the cul-de-sac. And he figured it was just, you know, a long way to go. And he ended up where he was. So he decided not to run away. And I thought I'd throw that story in. So we would take our bikes and we'd tell our mom we loved her. And we'd hop on our bikes and she'd tell us to be home by lunch. And we'd go. And we'd go all over the place. And we would just ride. We had a couple places we'd like to ride to. We rode to 31 Acre Park. We ran, we, we rode to the, the town park. We rode to the, uh, uh, when, when either one of us had 25 cents, we rode to the store and bought candy, you know, uh, and just, I mean, especially during the summer, we would hop on our bikes and we would just go ride. And you know, when one of us would get a kite, we'd go, We'd, we'd go to 31 Acre Park or, or just the cul-de-sac. Uh, 31 Acre Park was better because the neighborhood I grew up in had overhead wires. Um, and it's hard to fly a kite. Oh, it's not hard to fly a kite, but it's harder to fly a kite in a neighborhood where there's overhead wires than in a neighborhood where there's not overhead wires. And we always, you know... Um, oh, here's a fun fact. Um... We're both uh, related to Benjamin Franklin, and that yeah him, and uh, and so we knew you know the the story of him discovering electricity, you know from a very early age it was a brag point I think, but mom would tell us not to be like Ben when we flew our kites you know meaning don't get caught up in the uh, electrical wires, but I have I have a lot of good memories being at this park or that park or that park, um, you know, our bikes just laying you know, 20 feet, 50 yards over there while we're flying a kite. There was the time, um, again, shared room early morning. We weren't allowed to, to get up, get out of bed without permission. Mm, just house rule. Um, and, and Tim had a, a nose that needed tissues. Uh, at least this morning or that morning, I should say. Um, and he, uh, he blew his nose and he, you know, cause we can't get out of bed. That's, that's the rule. And he aimed for our, our common in room trash can and he missed. And I laughed and I said, it looked like a little flower and he, um, emptied the uh, tissue box up. And take another tissue, scrunch it up, throw it on the floor. And when mom finally came in, you know, and saw all these, you know, how, how many are in a box of tissues? 100, 500, 4.3 million? I don't know, a bunch, right? Mom saw these tissues on the floor. And Tim just smiled and said, look at all the flowers. Um, we had to pick them up. It was fine. Oh! Let me tell this story. Yeah, y'all will love this one. So I'm a little kid. I don't remember. Okay? <clears throat> and he had these cheap plastic handcuffs. And he wanted to arrest me. So he put one on, on my left arm, I think. My left wrist. And um, I'm just basing that on, on my memories. Um... And then he wanted to make sure I didn't get away. So he put the the other cuff on the doorknob of the of our shared closet. Cause back the in in that house, the closet doors were doors just like any other door, and they all had doorknobs on them. And then he ran off to go play. Um when mom found me, she found me handcuffed to the door. And, and she wouldn't, and, and Tim wouldn't let us break his handcuffs to get me out. So we had to wait till one of the, one of the neighbor men got home, uh, so he could pick the lock. And I remember it being like 19 days that I was, um, handcuffed, uh, to the, to the closet door. So it may have been, you know, an hour, maybe I remember we had a 
Morse code uh, machine that we would, you know, you know, Tim would sit in, in, in mom's room and I would sit in our room and we'd Morris code back and forth to each other. And he'd say, okay, I'm going to do a, and then he'd, whatever a is, I don't remember. And, and we'd sit there and we'd, we'd write down the messages that we were sending to each other. We did the, uh, uh, tin can and a string thing. Uh, if you know what that is. Um, you know, it was always easier to hear him out of the ear that wasn't pressed up against the can. Sure it was for me, too. It's a lot of great, really early childhood memories. And then when I was nine, and he was ten, we moved. We moved to Southern California. And we moved to our house where we each got our own bedroom. Which is really not a bad age to 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 do that at if, if you can if you can split your kids up each into their own room. My sister always had her own room, but we moved to SoCal, and, and we each had our room. And I remember the first night, um, Tim wanting me to sleep in his room with him because he didn't want to be lonely. And at the time, it was fine; it didn't bother me a bit. I wanted to sleep, and we we're gonna, you know. None of our furniture had gotten there. We were sleeping in sleeping bags on the floor. Uh, the floor in his room and the floor in my room were both still just floors. So I didn't care. And the second night, it, Tim wanted me to sleep in his room again. And and Mom said, no, you know, he's got his own room now. He, can, You guys can both sleep in your own rooms. And so we both, and our rooms were right, the doors to our rooms were right across the hall from each other. Uh, so if I opened my door and walked straight, I would walk face first into his door or his doorway, depending on whether it was open or closed. And so that second night we slept in our doorways um, uh, so we could still talk to each other because we'd been doing that. Oh, we moved when I was nine. We'd been doing that for nine years, uh, you know, talking to, talking each other to sleep. Eventually, when, especially when the furniture came in and, and they felt like rooms instead of just pieces of carpet we were sleeping on, we both got very much more comfortable with each. I mean, I loved having my own room. Um, everything I had was it. I know that I know it's not true when I say it, but it felt like everything I had was one of theirs first. You know, does that make sense? Um, I mean, I got Christmas gifts and birthday gifts that were just mine <laughs> when we were little and we'd have to get, and, and have to, and we'd get Christmas gifts. And because, you know, he and I were both boys and we were in a year and a half of each other, we both liked the same things. So there were always two. Tim would get a flashlight and I would get a flashlight. And so early, early on, the adults in our lives figured out that, well, his needed to be one color and mine needed to be another. Or if they didn't have different colors, mom would take a piece of masking tape and, and or, or just write straight on the thing with, a, uh, with you know, his initial or my initial. And, and like I said, I was nine. I, I was in fifth grade. So I was still going to an elementary school. But Tim was in sixth grade and he was going to middle school, which was six, seven, eight. And even though both schools were on the same lot, we went to two different schools now. And, and he started getting his own friends, which is normal and fine and healthy and blah, blah, blah. But at that point, we stopped becoming such good friends because he had other friends. As we aged, as we got through um, high school together, um, well, you know, middle school and then high school together, um, really the only thing we had in common was, uh, our name. He started hanging out with his other friends. I started realizing that, uh, I didn't make friends nearly as easily as he did. Um, I spent, um, a lot of time in my youth, uh, just playing around in my own mind. He spent a lot of time in his youth playing around with his friends. I don't have a resentment about that anymore, but I did for a long while. I guess it was my senior year in high school. And uh, 
mom and stepdad were gone away for the night. They went out to dinner. Or they're going on a date, you know, as, as you know, adults should do. Um, even married adults should do that. And uh, I was upstairs. And, and by this point, I'd, I'd known Tim, Tim had gotten busted for um, pot a couple times. Once legally busted, a couple times just busted by the parents. And and so we all knew Tim smoked pot. You know, he, he claimed he didn't anymore, but we all knew he did. Um, and uh, I was sitting upstairs in my room. That's the story I'll tell another day, how I got an upstairs room. And, and I saw him come home, and nobody knew I was smoking pot. And so I, uh, you know, was getting the seeds out. Now I haven't I haven't smoked pot in well over twenty years, um, so I don't know what it's like anymore. But when I was in high school and, and somebody sold you a a dime bag of pot, it was you know in weight at least one quarter seed and stem, right? Um, so you had to shift all that out. So I'm I'm separating the the good stuff from the bad stuff, and I see Tim come home driving his, I think it was his, if, yeah, driving his car or his truck, I don't remember which, and it doesn't matter, see him come home, and I, you know, oh shit, you know, nobody knows I'm doing this, and, and so I, you know, put a piece of paper over, you know, my project, and I, I go downstairs into the, into the pool, and, and Tim comes mm -hmm. out to the pool, because we lived in that pool. 10 minutes later or whatever it was. And uh, he says, hey, what is that up on your desk? And I looked at him. And in one of those moments of rare bravery, I said, well, what do you think it is? And he said, I think it's Colombian, man. I got some green bud. You want to try that? Um, <laughs> and that was the uh, first time I ever smoked green bud was with Tim. And, and it was a, uh, fun and and once we both realized we had that in common we became better friends again uh, to the point where we invented and i was gonna say dozens but that's not right probably but probably four or five good strong in the pool games that we could play uh with each other and and in the pool he and i were equals um on ground he was bigger and stronger than me but in the pool we were equals and, and anything he could do, I could do. So I loved the in the pool games, with the exception of um, underwater basketball. Then his physical size, um, he, he took advantage of it. I can't blame him. I'd do the same. Uh, underwater basketball, we had a essentially a, a, a what was a floating basketball hoop that lost its floaters and sank to the bottom now, and and we had a half deflated ball. And yeah, the idea was oh. I say underwater basketball, I should say full contact underwater basketball. And we had to get the ball down through the top of the hoop and out through the bottom. Um, it was never a high scoring game because it was full contact underwater basketball. Um, but, you know, we, we had fun doing it. Baseball we played. You had to keep it in the pool because otherwise, you know, you hit it over the fence and it's a home run. But now we don't have a ball. Um <laughs> He got out of school and he got into the pipe fitters union. And um, a pipe fitter is essentially a plumber for new construction. Right. So they put the pipes in originally and did that for a couple of years and, and worked at a, one of the jobs he had was at Anheuser Busch. And, and one of the pipe fitters that came years and years before him had put a tap, Anheuser-Busch, home of Budweiser. Um, one of the pipe fitters that came years and years before him had put a tap in the line before the, the beer got pasteurized. And so he would always, not always, often come home with a gallon milk jug container full of um, some really good beer. Because it wasn't heat pasteurized. It wasn't knocked down to 3.2. It was it was a really... I mean, you drink one of those and you had a six-pack of anything else. 
Um, it was it was nice. He'd share that with me sometimes. I so he got a job with the pipe fitters, and then for whatever reason, I I, I remember what he told me. Um, but for whatever reasons he had, he stopped that. Um, I know that uh, I know that Tim had a problem working for other people. That's one of the differences between he and I. I don't I don't mind it a bit. Give me a job. Give me the tools and tell me what to do. Um, he didn't like. He didn't like the third step in that. Tell me what to do. And when that when he when he stopped doing that, he moved in with my dad. I moved in. Uh, my dad lived four hundred miles away. Um, I I moved in six months a year later. Um, sometime later, after I had uh, completely destroyed my Southern California life. So we get there. And, and my dad's house only had one guest room. Tim was in it. And, and we get there. Or I get there. And he says, okay, I think we should probably, you know, it, it would be too much of a pain in the patookas to, to change guest room every night. You know, one of us sleep on the couch, one of us sleep in the, in, in the guest room. So why don't we, you know, why don't we switch back and forth once a week? And I said, that sounds great. And he says, well, I'm already up. And he's been there six months or a year. He says, well, I'm already there, so I'll, I'll take it for the first week. Um, <laughs> I told him no. And, and he knew he was trying to get away with something um, that he shouldn't, and he agreed. We lived together there for, I want to think, I, I don't know, man. I was smoking so much effing pot at the time that, that I have no real sense of time. We eventually moved out together and got a place in... Uh, in the town that we grew up in, as a matter of fact, and uh, he'd gotten him, he had gotten himself a uh, full-time girlfriend. <laughs> as you've heard me say, if you've listened to these others, uh, some of these others, he 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 met the woman who would eventually become his ex-wife, and then they moved out, and we really just lost that bond, which is too bad. Um, I mean, he'd come over and visit sometimes um, after I met the woman who would eventually become my ex-wife. He'd come, he'd come visit, and, and we'd all hang out. It was a good time, but it was never, never the same after that. And then, and then things happened. Um, he still had that sense of um, big brother, whereas um, I wanted to be more just brother. And so I would, and, and then I had, um, how do I want to say this? You know what? I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to say we stopped getting along. Okay. Sadly. And, uh, he raised his kids and I raised mine and, and we tried a couple times, uh, to become friends again. And it never really worked for either one of us which is too bad. Uh, we became friendly it, it, towards the end, which was nice. I completely glazed over the one specific story that I wanted to tell about him because I didn't write it down and I have the memory of a soil sample. <clears throat> so we're in high school and Tim was, Tim was down the hill playing with some of his friends. Uh, they're playing on a rope swing. I have a a history with rope swings, and it's not great. They were playing on a rope swing, and Tim fell off mid-swing. I think what he said was one person would be on the swing, and there were like three or four boys down there, the, the neighbor boys. And I was off someplace else doing something else. Who knows? I was probably playing in my mind somewhere. And uh, the the way Tim told it was, was they would... Uh, one of them would swing out on the rope swing and the others would chuck like rocks and dirt clods at him and see if they could hit him. I'm sure the people down the hill didn't really like it that much, but, you know, he fell. He must have gotten hit or something. I don't know. Because he fell off the rope swing and he fell onto a piece of concrete. Um, and he had a, a, a fractured, impacted humerus bone. Uh, which meant that the bone broke, uh, the bone right up, uh, the upper arm 
near the shoulder or within probably an inch or two of his shoulder, not only fractured all the way across, but also became severely out of place. So, you know, when, you know, fractured, obviously, that we know what that word means. Impacted, um, it didn't, like, leave his skin. It wasn't poking out or anything like that. Um, but it, it was, you know, it was off a good half inch or an inch from, from where it should be sitting if it were only a fracture. And they had to, um, I wasn't there for this. So, only stories. But the uh, the way the doctor had to reset his arm was the doctor had to uh, put a knee on Tim's chest and grab his arm uh, between the el- between the elbow and the shoulder, you know, the, the the big bone, and pull while another doctor put it back into place. And then he was in this cast, and this cast was the most glorious cast you have ever seen, short of a full body cast which I've also seen. It was from his waist all the way up to both armpits. His left arm was free, but his right arm was suspended above his head in a L, right? So his 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 hand was right above his head. So, I mean, go ahead and do that. Nobody's going to look. Um, put, put, put your... Put your arm in a, a in a ninety degree angle with your hand above your head, and and everything from his wrist down to his armpit was casted, uh, with a including a supporting bar which stretched from his elbow to the lower cast. It was the uh, man. This thing was a behemoth. It was huge. It, it had to weigh four thousand pounds. Well, at least thirty pounds. Um. And he was, as anybody who gets casted, miserable for the first couple weeks. But um, when your bone starts healing and things start feeling better, and I've, I've had several casts myself, um, when things start healing and you're used to the weight and you're used to the, the awkwardness of having it, it's just, I mean, and you're a kid, um, it just becomes part of you. Which meant that, you know... You know, pick, pick, picture this cast that I described, you know, and, uh, you know, we would shoot baskets and, and, and he got pretty good at left-handing them, but he got even better at using this giant behemoth of a cast as a baseball bat. So we'd pitch the ball to him and then he'd swing his whole upper torso and just smack a basketball. Now, again, we lived in a cul-de-sac. Fortunately, we were at the bottom of the hill in a cul-de-sac, up the hill. And we'd all laugh and, and, and wait for the ball to come back down to us and, and do it again. And we did that for a couple weeks, I think, until mom caught us and just completely flipped out, um, which was funny in and of itself. But sadly, um, Tim died. About five years ago, a little bit over, a couple couple days over now, and um, and I miss you, man.